Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to day four of our VHA State of Events as we continue the conversation about what we can learn from 2020 as we prepare for another busy year ahead. My name is Trevor Adam. Uh, I'm the Deputy Chair of the Victorian Healthcare Association and CEO at East Wimmera Health Service. To start, uh, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the many lands on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to welcome my colleagues working in hospitals and community health services across Victoria, particularly those working outside the metropolitan areas like myself, who've been able to participate in more sessions and conversations this year, thanks to the increased uptake of technology. After spending the past few days with the VHA focused on exploring lessons from the past 12 months, including our response to COVID-19, the impacts of bushfires and many other challenges that have presented themselves, Today, we're turning our attention to 2021 and the years ahead. It's no doubt something you've already spent significant time uh, thinking about, and you'll continue to focus on over coming weeks as the new year begins. After Zioni's conversation today with Tom Simonson, our VHA CEO, we'll then be asking an emerging healthcare leader who has recently been awarded the AWARE Super Emerging Leader Scholarship to reflect on what Zioni's comments mean for the health sector going forward. As well as listening to our reflections, I encourage you to share your stories and your own reflections using the hashtag, hashtag State of Health on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And please add your questions for our speakers to the chat, and we'll endeavor to get your answers to you today or throughout the week. We'll be unveiling a virtual time capsule for the health sector on Friday, which is tomorrow. And I invite you to share your photos, videos, and stories via the link on our homepage. If you were not able to join us earlier this week, you can catch up on the first three sessions on our website whenever you get the chance. And finally, tomorrow we'll be celebrating the sector with a series of activities designed to capture the stories of 2020 and profile the hard work across Victoria, as well as hearing from the team behind the Voices of Healthcare project. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce our special guest today, community builder and change maker, Zioni Walker. Zioni will be joining our CEO, Tom Simonson, for a discussion which we hope will get you thinking about how communities have changed as a result of 2020 and how to embrace change in the months and years ahead. Zioni has a diverse background as a human rights lawyer, social entrepreneur, change architect, community builder, and policy maker. As well as running her own social enterprises, Zioni has worked with Victoria Police, Legal Aid, and the Australian Centre for Moving Image. Zioni is currently a policy advisor within the, the Department of Premier and Cabinet in Victoria and continues to be involved in a range of community initiatives. So I say good morning to Tom and to Zioni and I look forward to hearing the discussion. Thank you, Trevor. Um, and I would also like to acknowledge the trad traditional owners of the land uh, upon which we're all meeting. And for me, that's the Jajawarung people and um, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And also to welcome Zioni, uh, Zioni Walker. Um, it's great to have you here and um, I'm looking forward to this conversation. So um, just as a starter, uh, Trevor mentioned the um, event at the Victorian Parliament last year um, and uh, you read out a letter to your younger self, your 18 year old self to be exact. How do you think that letter might have been different if you'd been writing it now with the pandemic behind us rather than in front of us? Exactly. It's so interesting because thank you very, very much for having me, by the way. And I also acknowledge that I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to the elders past and present. Um, so thank you to the VHA for having me. I think it's really interesting to have this sort of reflective conversation to get insights and innovation from a whole range of people. It's interesting when I think about that letter, because at the time I was at that um, session, none of us could have envisaged the, the year that we've had. And if I was writing that letter now, I actually will tell my 18 year old self that the year will start off with one of the worst bushfires in history that brought the four, to the fore the possibility of integrating First Nations science around land care and forestry and fire management with Western science that would actually make us feel climate change at a very visceral level. And then the pandemic will literally happen straight after on the back of that sort of horrendous experience. And in terms of the pandemic and what it brought, the things that I would 
tell my 18 year old self are the diversity of responses from all over the world. Um, my father lives in Japan and his partner lives in Hong Kong and the way they talk about the pandemic is a little bit different from the way we talk about it. So they didn't have a hard lockdown necessarily in Japan. I don't think they ever have. They've had suggestions that people should stay home and people have largely been uh, respectful of that. And I sort of compare that with my brother who lives in the US and my sister who lives in the UK and me here in Australia. So I'll talk about the diversity of experiences, but that the key learnings for me would be how those societies in East Asia adapted their learnings from say SARS and MERS and the digital solutions they developed then um, to quickly build that into their responses to the pandemic now. Um, how we in Australia and New Zealand uh, had a hard lockdown and our goal was elimination and how that impacted our society and our responses. And then the difference with the US, which in some ways has almost seemed like a little bit of an outlier because there's such a diversity of responses in different states in America. And then the sort of spotchy spikes that we've had in, in Europe, you know, you look at England and Spain and Italy and so on. And I would say to her, watch the documentary. It's the only way we can explain the year that we've had. But the core pieces of, pieces of advice for me or my observations have been the societies that have coped the best have been societies that have a high level of trust, collaboration, and care. That those three qualities were at an absolute premium. And those are the qualities that we want to take with us beyond 2020. Yeah, I think I think that's that's right. And and as somebody who has <clears throat> had involvement in documentary filmmaking, um, which is not something I can say to very many people, by the way, um, you you are talking from experience when you say that. And I just want to you've had a I mean, this is you've had a fairly varied background. Um, you've done a number of quite different things. And I, I watched another conversation um, with you where you talked about the fact you had a rather stereotypical expectation from your parents that you'd be a doctor, a lawyer or an engineer, and you've tried two of them. Um, <clears throat> I think your disdain for engineering was was clear, not for engineers, of course, but for engineering. Um, <laughs> On awareness um, of my limitations. Yes, that's it. That's right. That's the <laughs> diplomatic way of putting it. Um, <laughs> what you talked in, in the letter about education, the importance of formal education and the importance of seeing life as a kind of a learn, a constant learning opportunity. Um, do you just want to talk a little bit about that perspective uh, on, on education and on um, personal development? Because I found it I found it very um, interesting and your specific perspective, given yeah. where, you, where you've come from and your journey. Sure, sure. So um, like Tom said, that's exactly right. I sort of came from um, aspirational immigrant parent type context so it's not unfamiliar to all of us here um, where the careers at the time were really those three I think it's expanded now when I talk to other new migrants I hear that uh, accounting and architecture and also <laughs> all sorts of other skill sets have now been given the tick in my day it was just those three and like you said I have tried two of them but I didn't go on to be a doctor I just attempted medicine for a year I loved it but for all sorts of reasons moved on into law um, and so my uh, perspective and also I guess my context in terms of how did I move from all of those different things and end up where I am now and what has that given me what insights has, has that given me is um, I think I was just pursuing the path that had been laid down by my family and it wasn't until I decided so I took a, a stab at law. I was working as a lawyer at the Australian Center for the Moving Image, and I was working with filmmakers. I did know that I had an interest in filmmaking and the arts and creativity, but my proximity to creatives themselves actually escalated my leap into that world. So when I'd done my two years, I almost saw it as penance, right? I've done my two years, I've been in purgatory, I'm ready to get out. So my parents can't say anything beyond that point. And so I did go to documentary filmmaking school and, and come out and work on a lot of films for free, mind you, I wasn't a successful filmmaker in terms of making big money and making films that got nominated for things, but I got to test out my passion and my interest. However, what I learned from that was I didn't make that much money and I had a house and a mortgage and things and life that needed to be paid for. And it forced me to think about what I was bringing to the table, like what was the common denominator with all of these different things that I enjoyed that I could leverage off into a career where I could earn a living and yet still practice and live out my passions. 
And the core for me was storytelling, right? The interest and ability to tell stories and the proximity to people that I got my energy from being proximate to people. So it helped me reframe the career, which I did have, which was law, to one that was focused on people and social justice. And that's how I ended up working at the Aboriginal Legal Service, Victoria Legal Aid, Women's Legal Service, because they were all community-based legal services. And so my key um, reflection, if I was giving a talk, say at a legal institution today would be, please tell students that there are other careers as lawyers outside of commercial practices, because that's all we ever talked about in law school. So it was community, putting community at the core. And so that's informed my life from that point onwards. It's given me that absolute clarity in all of the different things that I've done. So even though it feels varied, uh, to me, I can see the connection points and it feels, it almost feels linear to me because I've identified what the commonality is. The so-called silver thread. Yes, exactly, <laughs> um, exactly, <clears throat> perfect. And, and it's interesting to think, you know, as you say, and and, legal study is not the only type of study that does this but this mm. idea that you do it's kind of an old-fashioned kind mm. of almost 19th century 20th mm. century idea that you do the study you become the lawyer mm. or the engineer or the mm. doctor or the accountant mm. the reality for our sector in health a lot of people who are in senior leadership positions started as those things yeah and then kind of used those fantastic skills that those that education gave them to broaden out into leadership roles or policy roles or even political roles. So exactly. I think that's it's a really important point to remember. And we often, we need to remember when we're talking to younger people, um, when you pick your degree, that isn't your life sorted. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Although that might stress them out more. Um, <laughs> certainly would have me when I was, when I was 18. Um, one of the things that the, the pandemic has made distressingly clear is the level of uh, inequality and mm. unequalness um, of our society. And, you know, we've had a number of conversations with people who've been very clear in saying none of this is new. It's just now that people who didn't know it was there now can see it because lockdown affected everybody in a similar way. I mean, some people had it worse, but everybody was locked down. Everybody has been impacted by the pandemic. What are your reflections as, a, mm. as, as someone who works with communities, with organizations mm. on change. Mm. What are your reflections of, of that kind of exacerbation, that increase in how obvious our inequality is when maybe before we could maybe just turn our heads away and not notice it quite so much That's when it didn't exactly impact right. us? Yes, it's so interesting because the, the pandemic is a metaphor for bringing the visible, the invisible visible, right? Whether it's a virus or the people who we'd made invisible by our systems. And I um, am currently doing some work with people who were in the tower buildings in Flemington, Kensington, North Melbourne. And they're a group of very young um, women who were activated and who've been mobilized by their experience um, during the lockdown. And so there are two things. One is the community perspective, which I found interesting. So the people in that community, the ones that I'm working with, had seen themselves as powerless. They had seen themselves at the effect of change rather than the cause of change. And because of the pandemic and the way it played down in terms of how the lockdown was managed, which was lock it down before we even start thinking about the sort of social welfare solutions, they had to themselves develop the social welfare solutions and they realized that they already had a community engagement map. They just never put it down on paper, but they knew the families that were experiencing family violence on their floor in their building. They knew the people who were experiencing distress around mental health or who were substance affected. They knew the family that was living in an overcrowded situation, et cetera, et cetera. And so when the lockdown happened without the social supports in place, they were activated to get the food to help that family or have this family member live in your house, et cetera. And they recognized their social capital. And for the first time, at least the young people I'm talking to, I don't know if their parents felt differently, they were being invited into policy settings and policy spaces with very senior decision makers to have a voice at the table. So I think that for them was a very, very new experience to be validated and affirmed in that way and to recognize that they actually had something of value and social capital that was absolutely necessary and that was actually keeping their communities in place. They just hadn't named it. Um, from a policymaker perspective, 
or an activist perspective, there was certainly that context of finally, at last, yeah, the decision makers can see what people have been advocating for for a very long time. And, and for policymakers, depending on where you sat on the sort of hierarchy, there was that sense of, well, we can now finally start acting on this or let's bring the people to the table who we've never really considered who we've had on our to-do list or who were actually in our blind spots, unfortunately. It, it did expose those fault lines. And so for me, that's at the forefront of my thinking. It's the recognition by communities themselves of their social capital, of them being a cause in change as opposed to the effect. Um, and then of systems and decision makers actually being forced to bring them to the table because they actually had a perspective that was necessary. I think that last point is really important because I certainly my experience was that for policy owners, if you like, mm -hmm. so, so the people who deliver um, on behalf of government or on behalf of others or large organizations, um, it, it was actually quite frightening not to have the answers. Mm. Because I think mm. those of us who are in those kinds of positions are so used to everybody coming to us and saying, what do we do? Mm. Um, and suddenly with a pandemic and you talk about the public housing um, lockdown and a number of our members, community health services were kind of, kind of suddenly in a position where they were expected to, to support people where in the past, they might not have been asked until, you know, exactly. two weeks in. Exactly. Um, and, you know, community health is fantastically well uh, equipped for that. And that was a, almost an eye opener for people in other parts of the system and across government. But this idea that it was almost, I mean, the, the, I, don't, I don't suppose it matters why it was done as long as it was done. But, you know, people having to go to people in their blind spot because mm. they just didn't have the answer. Exactly. And those people did. And exactly. I, do, do you think that was maybe a little bit, you know, you work, work with government, um, you know, was that maybe a little disconcerting for the average policymaker? <laughs> they actually <laughs> didn't have the answer. They had no choice. They had um, no choice. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, when I was reflecting on this question, that was one of the first things that came to mind, the issue of choice, which is, I think, in the past, as policymakers, we've had the option to um, decide what we want to bring into our decision making framework. Right. We had the power, so to speak, to make that call. But on this occasion, we had no choice because we did not have the answer. Yes, it was disconcerting, but it actually created a better, more integrated system because, of course, community organizations, whether it's in the health sector or any other sector, should be involved in the decision making. They already had those very sophisticated and robust community engagement strategies that the government wanted all along and needed. And, you know, I talked about the community themselves being activated, but their first point of call and reference was actually community organizations. They were the ones who were most responsive because they also knew the community. They also knew the people who were in their neighborhood, so to speak, because they have a very localized place-based approach to their work. Um, so absolutely, um, I, I think it was disconcerting, but because we didn't have a choice, we didn't have the opportunity to sort of self-flagellate, we just had to get on with it <laughs> and then bring them to the table and rely on their intelligence, right? Their sort of policy intelligence. And I, and I hope that that becomes embedded in the way that we work moving forward and not just in terms of over-reliance on community organizations, but resourcing them to continue to do that work. Well, we're absolutely on the same page there because I think one of our one of our challenges is as we look back on the in, you know in hindsight enormous success that uh, Victoria and Australia has had mm -hmm. in managing this virus and you know touch wood we, we we don't know there might be a third wave let's hope not um, but let's for now uh, you know think about where we're at um, the fear that some of our members express is that we will slide back into mm. uh, the pre-COVID way of thinking, the, um, you know, authority knows best and consultation means telling you something we're going to do after we've decided to do it rather than asking you what we should do or how we should do it. Um, do you, what do you think we can do to solidify that, to make it something we do keep doing that, that, that some of the working styles that we've created that work really well during the pandemic mm. don't just disappear six months I don't think they'll disappear in days but they mm. might you know if they disappear over in months, time or years what do we do to stop that kind of gradual yeah. slide it's difficult isn't it you sort of want somebody who's got <laughs> who lived through the pandemic before <laughs> the Spanish flu or even SARS or MERS and other jurisdictions to say well we what did you do differently that 
built these type of practices into your system? How did you embed this? So in places like Singapore and, and Taiwan and, and Japan and the rest, how did you embed this into your systems? When I've spoken to my father who still lives there, he tends to sort of talk very strongly about technology and digital technology and how, because that is actually a way of living now, um, building that into their processes ended up consolidating it, if that makes any sense. So for instance, when you think about contact tracing, they'd already developed a system for contact tracing that was digitized in those parts of the world. So when this happened, it was just a question of activating it because it already existed. They built the infrastructure. So for me, I think it's almost about going to ground zero and saying, now that we know what we know, how would we design the system differently to have all of those people at the table or have all of those contexts at the table? I think if we just go, if we continue as we are, where we have community organizations or community groups or, or others who've been marginalized at the table, it's very easy to sort of go back to closing the table off and starting to shift people back out. And everybody feels comfortable in their own silos. I think it really is back to systemic design. How do you go back to the system to say, how do we redesign the system from scratch? now that we know what we know, because the infrastructure has to be different. It can't just be, we're just including people to the table. It's actually about redesigning the infrastructure that supports a system that says all of these people are at the table from the very, very beginning. Uh, and for me, that's the only way it can be sustainable. Otherwise, through attrition and time, people will start getting excluded because we'll all be comfortable, including community, right? Everybody will be comfortable operating from the context that they're familiar with. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's kind of, you know, tokenism died during the pandemic because yeah. we, didn't, we didn't have a choice. And I think tokenism kind of brings me to my next point. Um, the One of the changes that we've all observed, uh, whether we liked it or not, is, is working from home, is changing mm. the way we actually work as mm. individuals, as teams and as organisations. And one of the things I've heard people say is that that you know, we always talk about leveling the playing field for, for women, for people with caring responsibilities, for people who want to work flexibly because they want their life and their work to balance in a different way than the average nine to five, five days, Monday to Friday. And it did that leveling in a period of weeks, which could have taken decades, may, may never have happened. Do you think that that change will ultimately be seen to have been positive and um, is it something, you know, do you think it has actually leveled the playing field? Mm, um, exactly. Maybe it's just fake. <laughs> That's a very interesting premise. So at the very beginning, uh, I definitely felt that way and it was a relief. And I am, I am somebody who actually sits in that caring space. I have um, elderly uh, parents who live in my home who we care for, uh, as well as young people. But my sense now is we're working harder than we ever have, that our, our work life and our home lives, yes, they've collided in our homes, but it's meant that we can't actually draw that distinction anymore. And we're just working non-stop. So I think there's another conversation that has to be had, which is that's fantastic that digital technology has enabled us to work from wherever we want to, but how do we learn to actually turn off the button and build that also systemically, right? So it's not just me turning off the button, but it's our boss is also agreeing that the button should be turned off philosophically, because if people don't have an opportunity to de-stress, to reflect and refresh, then they're not coming back to work fully prepared and energized. So I think, yes, there was that leveling of the playing field, but there certainly has been some baggage that we've brought with that, which is an inability to draw a distinction and that that's the thing that we now have to learn moving forward. It's a strange problem to have, isn't it? And something that we're not, I don't think any of us would have thought we would have in January this year, the idea that at one point, I know we talked to our staff at the VHA and, and, and to others who said, well, when you're locked down, there's actually there's nothing else to do. And so you end up throwing yourself into <laughs> your work and then not being able to tell the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, so I think hopefully that will change a little bit as we're allowed to go places, you can go back into the office, et cetera. But I do think that's really, it's an interesting challenge that you you pose this this kind of, this, this uh, you know, dissolving of boundaries yes. in an unhelpful way. Exactly. And, and it's also the boundaries that we've, um, or the way it's played out has also impacted our families, right? So. For 
people that I care for, um, they understood that when you came home, you had switched off from work to a large extent. But now they don't know when you switched off. They're used to you constantly saying, no, not now, not now, not now. I'm working, right? So then in their minds, you're working all the time. So until, until you tell me you are not working, you are working. And so that for them, their socialization, we've socialized them as well into this notion that we're workers first before carers. That's really frightening to actually articulate that. But I've heard this across the board from a number of um, people in community that their families, particularly children, are seeing them as worker bees first and then a parent second. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty... That's pretty terrifying when you it's put it that pretty, way, isn't it? It's I mean, they, a bit we, of an we, indictment. <laughs> we always were, but they couldn't see it happening. Yes, they um, couldn't now see it happening. Now it's very obvious, particularly if you're sitting at your dining table when you're, mm. you're working. Um, you, given you your background in documentary filmmaking, we've had a very interesting year in health, um, as you might have noticed. Um, and how, as a as a as a filmmaker, would you? What lens would you use to um, maybe? make that documentary about the year that we've had from the perspective of, of health providers you know we've seen um you know nurses and doctors with you know the masks on and the you know the the, the sore face uh, from having worn it for 12 hours in a row and people completely exhausted they've just watched four people die in quick succession and not been able to do anything for them um the aged care outbreaks all of those things that we've yeah just from your perspective how would yeah. you how would you start to make that documentary to, <laughs> I know. to, to do honor to that story without kind of grotesquely, yeah. you, know, you, you know what I'm trying yeah, to say. <laughs> exactly, sort of exploiting the context or yeah. picking on the things that are very obvious. That's a really, really interesting question. And I've sort of thought about it because there's so many important um, and powerful visual cues. Like you said, you know, there's the mask and how to use that as a symbol to tell a story for what we've been masking and what we've now unmasked. Um, and I've thought about it and I'm thinking about it from the, con the many, many perspectives, right? You could make a, 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 not a comedy, but a bit of a, a bit of a narrative of, and I'll give you an example. My sister is an epidemiologist in the UK. Now, all of these years that she's been in public health, I've never spoken about her as an epidemiologist because I couldn't say the word. So I've always just said, oh, she's a scientist. <laughs> You know, you don't need to know the details because you won't know what it means anyway, right? That was the subtext. And then this year, I've had to learn how to say epidemiologist properly because they've been thrown um, to the fore of this conversation, as well as a whole range of other health professionals. I mean, who knew? Most people didn't know we had a chief health officer, let alone what the person's name was or who they were in other states. And now they're at the forefront of our thinking. So, I mean, the healthcare system has always been one of the most trusted systems in our society, as well as the healthcare professionals, actually beloved professionals. Um, if I was making a film, I think the context that I'd also be interested in exploring would be the sort of continuum of private public. So because I have family members in different parts of the world, I always do think about these things from a global perspective. And that private to public continuum in terms of a discourse, you can use that to frame the way it's played out in different societies. So for an example, in societies or even in groups where people are very, very individualistic, they're thinking about their personal health. For them, health is a very individualized context, right? So why do I have to download the COVID safe app? It's an inconvenience to me. I don't want my private information with in other hands, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I like telehealth, however, because individually it benefits me. So yes, big tick for that. So I'm happy to give up my personal information for that purpose, but not this other purpose, right? So I'm not critiquing any of these things. I'm just using them as examples. But from a sort of public good perspective, people who are conscious of the public good are more likely to buy into the concept of, I'm happy to trade my personal convenience for the lockdown. I'm happy to trade or provide my personal data for this reason, even though I have some doubts or I'm a little bit skeptical about its potential uses in the future. I don't know, have you frozen? I feel like we've frozen. I haven't frozen. Or okay, maybe so I you have. can still hear me? Yes. Oh, perfect. Okay, I've frozen, you've frozen, but I'll just keep talking if, if you can still hear me. Yes. And so that context of individualized um, responses to public good responses, the sort of private to public, 
for me is a really important perspective not to to lose like what does public health actually mean a lot of people have never thought about it they've only ever thought about health from an individual perspective i'm well my family's well and that's all that matters but the fact that my health and my well-being has an impact on yours or yours has an impact on on mine or it has an impact on the whole system a lot of us outside of the healthcare system haven't been forced to consider that. And so when people, I was in a group the other weekend and we were talking about the lockdown measures and there were some members of that group that had a very strong perspective that it was harsh and unnecessary. And they were people who were coming from a very individual private health context, right? Like health is private, I mean, context as opposed to health and public health. You've now, everybody's moving now, thankfully. Okay, so you're not, you're no longer frozen. Um, and so, when we talked about the lockdown as it wasn't so much about how fatal or virulent the virus was it was also to protect our health system for people who were thinking about it from an individual perspective that was a missed context it's like well i don't know and i don't care i just want to be able to do what i want to do so i think as a filmmaker i would like to explore the sort of private public health perspective that would be interesting for me because it helps also tell the narrative globally like why does america have a different response to japan or australia i think that, that is a that is a fascinating way of looking at it and i know certainly as someone working in in healthcare a lot of those themes whilst we probably haven't described them that coherently a lot of those themes have kind of come through what is the responsibility of community to the people who are here to protect you Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if we're if we're wearing, I say we, I am very lucky not to have had to have been in this position, but have enormous respect for all of our members that have been. If you're wearing the mask, if you're wearing, in many cases, much more than just a mm -hmm. mask, mm -hmm. um, and you're putting yourself through absolute hell, not able to um, hug your children at night because you might be infectious or they might be infectious and you can't afford to get sick, um, not even being able to go home, um, mm -hmm. having to do many, many shifts in a row, uh, not having it, all of that kind of thing, what responsibility does society then have to you mm. in order for you to keep keeping them safe? And I know, mm. I know having that conversation um, earlier in the pandemic with journalists who were very keen to help get that message out there, by the way, and great respect to them for that. But, but it was sometimes almost seen as, as trampling on people's rights yeah. to ask them to just do their bit. Mm. And it didn't ask, it didn't say, compared to what we were doing, it didn't mm. seem like that big an ask. Mm. And I just found that really, and I, I, I know it comes from a position of, you know, fear, uncertainty, and, and it's not fair to just dismiss that, mm. but it felt pretty insulting, mm. I, I have to say. And mm. I know a lot of our members felt that way. You know, mm. people were getting spat at because they were asking, mm visitors to wear masks and, and, and not not all over the place but mm. you know, we're cases of that and I just think it's really interesting the way you've just kind of described it phrased it of that private attitude versus the public attitude I suppose. Mm, mm, mm. Um, we uh, you, you've you've been actively involved in, I'm going to use the, the pivot word that we're also uh, fond of. So this is a sort of a tan, not tan, a completely different subject, but you've been, you've been actively involved in supporting women in leadership. Um, what are some of the key things that boards or organizations can do um, to attract people from more diverse backgrounds to be involved in um, the leadership of systems like ours? It's certainly something that in public health, we talk about a lot. And I think we're relatively successful, but we're mm. still nowhere near as successful as we would like mm. to be. What, what mm. are some of your insights into, mm. into what we can do or what others can do um, to be more successful at, at actually mm. being diverse rather than just saying, oh, let's be? Yeah, <laughs> I remember I worked at a, a legal practice where we were having that conversation about the board and, and the solution was let's hire a diversity person to help us look into this. And that's where it ended, right? Even though the intentions were good, um, it was just a sort of interesting reflection on how it played out. I think there are a few things that come to mind and I, I don't want to miss anything. So one of them certainly is around capacity building. There have been times when I've personally also been invited to boards or other people I know have been invited to boards because they brought a particular perspective, right? So that was fantastic. However, sitting on a board requires a whole range of different skill sets besides that different voice right so you need to understand budget and financial management and governance and etc right risk management and so on and there were times when i thought 
boy, it would have been really helpful if I was given a scholarship to the Australian Institute of Company Directors course, right? Like that's just $5,000 of an investment. Um, but all of a sudden this person is enabled to fully participate as a board member, right? So yes, they're still bringing the diverse perspective, but they're also bringing all of the building block tools that you need to operate fully as a board member. Um, so I would actually talk about and think about being prepared to invest in people. So a lot of the times you'll have diverse candidates that already have all of those skills and that's fantastic. But sometimes that extra person who has a really, really different perspective might not have that, right? So for me, I was educated in the West and all of those sorts of things. So having me on my board on a board Yes, I'll bring a diverse voice, but it will not be as different as somebody else who might have been born somewhere else and had really, really difficult circumstances and have been marginalized for maybe most of their life, for instance. So I would encourage the thinking around investing in people to be able to capacity build, to have those building blocks to participate fully at decision making tables. So that's number one. The other thing is also about being comfortable with discomfort. So, you know, you have different voices at the table for a reason, right? They're going to bring up perspectives that are in conflict with our own, that are in conflict with systems that we're familiar with, that show up the fault lines in our own systems or sectors or organizations. And that if we're not adaptable or comfortable with the uncomfortable positions and perspectives they bring to the table, well, then we're not going to reap those benefits. So I think for me, that has been fundamental, not even just on boards, but in organizational settings to say, well, let's be honest, how comfortable are we with this different perspective, which we don't know what it's going to be just yet, but this different perspective being at the decision-making table. Like, why is this person or why are these people here? Are they really just to inform our practice? Is that their purpose? Or is this a truly collaborative exercise? And I think it's really important to ensure that the people who play a role in those spaces are cared for and empowered. I've certainly had the experience and I know of others because I sit at uh, tables with other sort of diverse women leaders where we have these conversations um, they're not confidential conversations, but we have these conversations as part of our own reflection and self-care, which is that um, sometimes you find yourself in positions where you're speaking on behalf of other groups um, who might be at the end of decision-making in ways that are unfortunate, but then you're also at the decision-making table. So you're sort of straddling both worlds where you're at the effect of, and you're also at the cause of uh, decisions and change. And that sometimes it takes a while for you yourself to learn how to navigate and balance those two interests. When I worked at Victoria Police and I was their human rights manager, I had people in different diverse communities think of me as their representative at the table. Whereas in reality, I was a public service employee. That, that was my primary role. I wasn't an activist or an advocate. I certainly was bringing a human rights perspective that was informed by community to policy development, but I wasn't a spokesperson. And so I had to learn that distinction and I had to then socialize all the community groups that I ever interacted with, that that wasn't my role, right? That that was their role. And my role was to empower and create a pathway to bring them to the table. So just to be mindful that when you have people in those positions in your organization, that they also need to um, have spaces for their own self-care and, and management of those two dual roles that they sometimes play. It, it's really interesting. I mean, having grown up in England and now having moved to Australia, mm -hmm. it, it's very, very stark that our culture is one of not being comfortable with people who don't just kind of go along. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, sitting around board tables where we talk about diversity, but really, we don't know what that means, not, mm. not coming from a position of, of, of being unkind or, yes, being, yes. you know, it's, it's a genuine, it's generally quite genuine, yes. but understanding the implication of that when you were exactly. brought up only to speak when spoken to yes. and all that kind of, um, yes. and, you know, and until you're 50, you're not allowed to have an opinion. And I'm, yes. I'm, that wasn't said <laughs> quite that overtly. Yes. But, you know, it's interesting for me as a white, <laughs> sort of, I suppose, middle-class man, mm. because I'm under 50, often to be looked at 
as oh, what do young people think? Uh, yeah, I've got no <laughs> idea. I don't see myself as as being one. But you know, it's sort of this this idea that we we're, we're token almost because we don't really know what not being token looks and feels. Yes, like. yes, and, yes. And if yes. for people to sit on a board, it, it, which is a very serious, you know, kind of hierarchical environment, and be comfortable in discomfort mm. how do we train people for that mm. it's not really something you can train you've got to kind of throw them in but exactly it's it's really it's an interesting challenge mm. um and particularly if you're the only yes of whatever kind of background yes you are yes exactly like swimming against the tide exactly exactly and you're also educating yourself too right because you're the only you've only ever been the only and you don't know anybody else who can tell you what that's like. So you don't even know if your experience is just happening in your head or if this is a real experience until you reach out into the literature or meet others and realize that, oh, this is, this is normalized, right? You have those normalizing conversations. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we're, we're, we're um, pretty much out of time, but I just wanted to ask if you could, um, I, I'm gonna switch my first question on its head. If you could write a letter to yourself a year from now, and you could say, these are the things that you mustn't forget, because we know over time we will start to mm. forget things. Everything mm. will become rose tinted spectacles. It won't have feel as we won't remember that it was as bad as it was or yes. we'll think it was worse than it was or whatever. What would you want 12 months from now? In terms of advice from today, what would you want to be hanging on to? And for our audience, what would you want them to be hanging on to um, and not losing for 2021? Keep telehealth. <laughs> uh, yes. We will. I think decisions have already been made about that. I think there was an announcement last week, wasn't there? Um, though I have doctor friends that have a different perspective, so I'll leave that at the table. Um, I think the key things for me would be asking better questions, right? So who is not at this table, right? If decisions are being made, whose voice is not in the room, how do we get their voice and their perspective to the table? That's one, and that's actually quite a superficial one, but I think it's absolutely critical. The other underlying one that I think gets at the root of it for me is how do we go to ground zero and design our system differently? Now that we know what we know, right? How do we design our systems differently? Because if we don't deal with it at a systemic level, then it's all just going to be cosmetic and it will fade away, like you say. So fundamental, it's systems and design thinking for me. Change the system and you change the impact and the outcome. Thank you, that's, uh, that's brilliant. And I'm, I'm so grateful to you for the conversation we've been able to have this morning. Um, and on behalf of our audience and, um, uh, and uh, the VHA and our system, um, thank you very much for participating and being so generous with your time and your insights. Thank um, you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you for having me, really appreciate it. So um, to help us reflect on, on this great discussion, um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Aisha Mansfield from Dental Health Services Victoria, um, who is the recipient of the Aware Super Emerging Leaders Scholarship. And I'm very proud, given that I'm on the board of Aware Super, and it's, it, I, didn't, I wasn't a judge, I had nothing to do with it, I can't claim any credit, I'm afraid, but I was delighted to see um, the scholarship from all of the applicants across the country go to a Victorian first off, but also somebody from one of our member organizations, um, Dental Health Services Victoria. So that's absolutely fantastic. Um, good morning, Aisha. And um, uh, before you share your um, reflections on that conversation that, that uh, Zioni and I have just had, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you're planning to use the scholarship? Tom, thank you so much, and Zioni, for your wonderful conversation this morning. Such thought-provoking. If I may, firstly, as an Aboriginal woman, it's super important to me to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which I am situated. I work and live on Wurundjeri land. So I'd like to pay my respects and extend that to uh, all traditional owners throughout Victoria as well. Um, so a little bit about myself. I've been working uh, and began working in the dental field about four years ago as an Aboriginal trainee dental assistant. And I've quickly become super passionate about providing good healthcare um, and helping to support patients um, in having better uh, oral health outcomes in particular as well. 
So in saying that, I'm looking to further my studies in 2021 and uh, go on to a Bachelor of Oral Health, which hopefully will uh, give me the, the skills to work as an oral health therapist and then shooting forward uh, with hopes to work maybe as a dentist in the future as well. Yeah. That's, that's really good. And, and um, given, given your, you, you've listened to the conversation, um, what were your reflections on, on what we talked about? If I, if I can, firstly, I think it's really important for me to acknowledge uh, the letter to yourself, Sione. It was such a significant talk that you did. And I think, um, I think we can use it as a reflection as well as we think about, you know, how things have changed with this pandemic as well. So I just wanted to touch on that and say that it was very inspiring to me particularly as well. Um, something that really stuck out to me in the conversation for, between yourself, Tom and Zioni, was around the education and self-development of an individual. I think that in itself is going to provide the drive to be able to make a change. See, from the pandemic uh, this year in 2020 and, you know, moving forward, be as an individual to be able to make a change and utilising platforms, you know, not working in silos, if you will, and be, you know, using those platforms to met, to step up. Um, and personally for myself, considering that the bachelor might not be that final step and utilizing those to kind of consider where else I could personally make a difference as well. So that was something quite significant. Um, and I think tying in with that, the conversation around, you know, utilizing individual people and you know in the sense of being on a board enabling those people to be able to to continue to self-develop and gain skills as well um, I think as you said getting having the voices of people on board who are going to make um, those policy makers those those rule setters how do we make a change if we're sitting so comfortably? I think we need to consider the changes and hear it from, from you know, individuals who are in a community setting as well. Definitely. I think the other, one of the most significant things that spoke out in your conversation, Tom and Zioni, was that around um, the women that you mentioned from the Flemington Towers as well. And just, the significant impact that they could have around, you know, making those decisions and, um, sorry, um, you know, involve, involving them to not just resolve, you know, community issues, but help to evolve them as well, mm -hmm. evolve them and make changes. Um, I, for me, somebody who works closely with patients and things, it really stuck out about patient-centred care mm, as well. Mm. Utilising those people who are living in the thick of it, um, utilising their voices um, to make that change as well. I think that was something and those women and yourself, Sione, are so, so inspiring and, and that was something that really stuck out to me as well. Mm. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you go. Thank you. Thanks for the reflections. It's always really powerful when you hear back from people who are sitting in an audience uh, straight away to get a sense of what they got from what we, we shared and discussed so openly. Thank you, Aisha. I appreciate that. And Thank good you. luck. Thank you both so much for having me. It's been an absolute honor. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you, thank you, Asia. Thank you, Zioni. Um, uh, that's been fantastic. And as you say, it's great to get an immediate review. Um, although, you know, there's also a risk in that. But thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and now I will, I will hand back to Trevor. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Asia, so much for sharing your reflections today uh, and what it means for uh, you and what it means for healthcare more broadly. Uh, congratulations again, and Tom did mention it, on being awarded the AWARE Super Emerging Leaders Scholarship and good luck uh, going forward. Thanks also to Zioni for your time today and to Tom for the great conversation. Uh, I think there's plenty that we can all take away from that conversation today. Uh, we'll pause for a moment now. We've got a special message from our partner, Governance Evaluator, and I'll be back on the other side. Hello, my name is Bea Mercer. I'm the CEO and founder of Governance Evaluator. 
And we proudly partner with BHA and the Australian Centre for Healthcare Governance and Joanne Morfitt to provide the health sector with review and development programs, both for the board and for individual directors. We just want to say a huge shout out to our heroes, the board, the chairs, directors, CEOs, executives, and all the amazing board supports we've been working with. What a year 2020's been. And the reason we want to call out to all these amazing, resilient people is that this year started in the, with a background that I don't think anyone could have been prepared for. It was bushfires. So we sailed into Christmas in 2019, December, all looking forward to 2020 being that even year. We love round numbers. And things finished really well, and everyone was really looking forward to heading 2020 together. It's kind of like a special year. Guess what? First thing that happened, bushfires. So in January, February, all of our amazing boards and directors and their communities were dealing with that. Also, quite a lot of our Victorian health services were dealing with cyber attack, which is one of those things that you hear about, you talk about, you've got policies about, but you never think it's actually going to happen. Well, it actually happened. And it was quite profound, the impact of that. So we all sort of recovered from that by March. And as we sailed into March, nobody, in fact, nobody even used to talk about pandemics other than Bill Gates. And we sailed straight into that and we went into the first lockdown where I think we were all kind of enthusiastic and energetic. Then in June, July, we sailed into the second lockdown and boy, did that get us. And we were going through a whole lot of royal commissions at the time, aged care, banking, you name it, there was a royal commission about it. And last but not least, across well, pretty much across the world, but across a lot of the areas that we were working, we were facing funding changes as well. But guess what? Guess what? Our work showed us what these amazing boards, their directors, their chairs, CEOs, executives, and those amazing board support people, those people who kind of secretly just hold everything together, Guess what they did? Overnight, we watched them all become virtual governors. Now, last year, at the end of last year, we were going, we're actually going to ring up Zoom and we're going to say to them, we work with 65% of Victoria's healthcare sector and Zoom, can you help us teach everybody how to use Zoom so that they actually can have their board meetings virtually, we can Zoom in and all that sort of stuff. But nobody thought that we would actually have a pandemic and that would have this extraordinary outcome that takes a lot of effort and overnight everyone became virtual governors for that we just want to congratulate you you introduced your COVID-19 plan that was your entire focus and for a lot of you who are new directors absolutely no face-to-face -face at all you know how you manage risk of an organization and you need to walk around the organization you need to see and understand what the risk is you guys didn't even get to do that you were working with and supporting from a governing perspective ceos executives entire organizations going through something they'd never been through before virtually we want to congratulate you for that you actually managed risk virtually and understandably, you got down in the weeds. Who wouldn't? That That is a crime we all are guilty of in 2020. But nine times out of ten, I didn't meet a director that when they're actually told that, they didn't understand. And they also tried so hard to be strategic. I watched everybody think, oh, my God, at the end of the day, we do actually need to be strategic. And our whole team watched everybody try to remember the job of a director is to stay and be strategic. And look, what I want to comment and commend you all for is you all did this. This was not your daytime job. You did this on top of being in lockdown yourself, not once but twice. And if you're in Melbourne, that was a big deal. In the rural areas, it was a big deal too. But in Melbourne, it was stage four. That was unprecedented. 
you also, quite a lot of you managed homeschooling. You managed all of a sudden everybody's children. I don't know about you guys, but everybody's children didn't want to live in Melbourne anymore. They all wanted to live at home. And so not only did you run and manage and govern your extraordinary health services, but you also had an entire crew around you. So I have to say, we at the Governance Evaluator were guilty of some of the most extraordinary bombing for our Zooms, and so were all of you. But guess what? We all had a sense of humour. We all appreciated it. And just a little heads up on about the data of our Zooming and all of those sorts of things. The other day, we had our advisory board meeting, our last one last week, and my staff just for June, no, well, July, August, September, I think, added up my Zooms. It was well over 550 Zooms alone that I had done. Pretty amazing statistics, and I know you guys have done no less. So, as I said, we proudly partner with VHA. We've done so since 2013. And we proudly partner with the Australian Centre for Healthcare Governance. And that's Tom, big shout out to Tom, our CEO, big shout out to Dr. Sue Matthews, the wonderful chair of VHA, and a massive shout out to Joanne Morfitt, who we have the pleasure of partnering with, and she does all the convening with our boards, does an extraordinary job. But we have 68 healthcare organisations that we work with. That's over 860 directors and executives, extraordinary people who we watched cope with all of this admirably. And do you know what? Even despite these incredibly tough times, that actually over 50 of these organisations did their board review and their director review and their director development programs. Absolutely outstanding stuff. Take a big bow, guys. And that meant your data was part of our benchmark data this year. Got an exciting um, benchmark this year that's all about your corporate modules. And then next year, of course, there's the opportunity if people want to order um, the sector-specific modules. But what a what a sterling effort. Well done, everybody. And thank you again, VHA, for doing that with us. And thank you to my own incredible team. They are just incredible, our IT operations, our data analysts, business development and customer care, our amazing customer care team. So why is this so important? Well, I just want to give you a little bit of insight into just the impact that the boards alone that we work with have on our incredible community of Victoria. Over 2.1% billion dollars in annual revenue comes through these organisations that these incredible people govern, over 14,000 and plus and counting employees, over 16,000 plus volunteers. So this is why this work is so important and this is why we absolutely care about what we do and we just want to say, well done, we think it was an amazing job. So from the whole of our team, we want to thank you and congratulate you. And let's have a little think about moving forward for 2021. What does that mean? Well, we've got a big job ahead of us. We're actually not out of the woods yet. We've all been living with corona. We're going to live with it for longer. Great programs with vaccine and things coming. But we're also, as governors, are incumbent it's incumbent upon us to think about the future. We've got to do some blue sky thinking. We can't just focus on the risk. We've got to think ahead. And even though we've been through a pandemic, at no other time in our life has it been more important than now to actually be blue sky in our thinking. My big tip to all of our amazing boards is that every single board in their first meeting or their strategic planning meeting should watch the David Attenborough A Life on Our Planet video because one of the big things moving forward as directors we need to know and understand is about climate change. It's not will it be climate change, it's that it's here and we need to understand some of the simple things that David Attenborough poses in his amazing video to us all 
that we can do. And uh, at a health level, that's what we're responsible for. We need to take on and embrace diversity. We've also got to work hard with our stakeholder engagement. And by embracing diversity, that means we need to work closely with our first Australians. We need to reduce that poverty. We need to reduce that gap of health inequities. And we've also got to focus on and embrace all the other areas of diversity in our communities, whether we be in small bush nursing centres right through to our large metro hospitals. We need to embrace diversity and make that a key agenda item. And last but not least, we need to agenda time to talk about IT, IT security, what it means, what an important part of our life it is moving forward. So what an exciting year 21 is going to be. We've done an amazing job this year and we are privileged to be working with you all and we really look forward to working with you in 2021. And thanks to Fiona and thanks to Governance Evaluator. Um, it was a great summary of the year and I won't keep you waiting any longer. Thanks to everybody for joining us today. Uh, we'll be posting the videos from today online uh, from about lunchtime, so I encourage you to share those with your colleagues. Uh, please join us again tomorrow at the same time with the same Zoom link uh, for the final day of State of Health. Focused on celebrating the sector as well as hearing voices from the sector with a presentation from the Nossel Institute, uh, sharing their findings from their Healthcare Voices project. Uh, and don't forget, you can continue the conversation uh, online on Twitter, LinkedIn and Facebook using the State of Health hashtag. Thanks and thanks for joining us and good morning.